Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Today, we have a very, very special show. I have the head coach of the University of San Francisco Dons with me today, men's team, all right? His name is Pablo Pires de Almeida. Nice. Is that right? Pablo Pires? Great job, Harry. Perez? Great job. All right. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks for joining me today. So, Pablo is a former standout on, on the USF Dons team from 2000 to 2005. Three-time All-West Con West Coast Conference selection in singles and doubles, earning, earning him first-team singles honors as a senior. He climbed as high as number 81 in the Division I singles rankings and number 70 in doubles. In 2004, Pablo became USF's first recipient of the pre prestigious ITA Arthur Ashe Leadership and Sportsmanship Award. Graduated from the University of San Francisco in 2006 with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. Pablo played professionally on various circuits around the world. Following his professional career, Pablo became a high performance coach, mentored some of the top players in the United States, coached boys 18 Northern California national team, and remains active in the USTA and Northern California tennis programs. Pablo enters his 10th season as the Don's head coach in 2021. So everybody's probably asking, you know, you got LSU Tigers, right? Alabama Crimson Tide, right? Cal Bears? What exactly is a Don? Great question. <laughs> Think Zorro. Zorro. Okay. Do you know Zorro the hero? Well, some of the younger viewers probably don't know what a Zorro is. Zorro but... is a noble person from Mexico and or Spain and you, you have a, a, a fighter that fights for the poor that fights for injustice that fights for you know uh, kind of like a Robin Hood character but it's a noble person that gets the name Don by the community so you have to earn it it's a respectful name that's given to you when you do something for other people so the Dons are the Zoros, it's, a, it's usually a cape with a sword, with a mask, and a sombrero kind of hat. Oh, is that why there's a sword in the uh, logo? In the old logo, okay. you saw it with a sword, and Zoro would have done a little ch -ch -ch cut with a Z, and they used to have that as well. Yeah, and the old uh, logo. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's it. So, so USF is a private Jesuit school. So that... Yeah, it goes, it goes to the roots. It right. goes to the roots of the school. Got it, got yep. it, got it. Yep. Is there a little Italian kind of heritage in that? Because of Don, you think of Don, Italian? Definitely. So, so it's Spain, Italy, Latin America, Don, right? It's, it's all over there. And, uh, and, and it has that religious, that religious kind of roots as well. So back in the day, you know, Don this, Don that, yeah. and, and everybody that was older in the community carried that respect and that weight of the Don. Got it, got it. So it's like Mr. or, or the, the, wisdom the wisdom of the person. Definitely, right? I definitely. Got you. Okay. All right, look, so let's jump in now. Um, as a college head coach, what are you looking for in a player for your team? Like I'm, I'm talking about like in the high school ranks, when you do recruiting, w what are you looking for? So for our team, we're only allowed to have eight players now. So with those restrictions, we can't hold a lot of guys and all the guys have to be game ready. So, you know, two guys go down, I need my eight player, gonna, he's gonna go in at number six and he's gonna have to perform. He's gonna have to compete against the best players in the country. So I'm looking for, you know, if you, if you look at UTR, a good cutoff for us is 11. If you're an 11 UTR or higher, then you can be in our top eight. So that's our good kind of cutoff point. Um, if I see a 10, five UTR, but you know, uh, he's showing that he's improving a lot, 
then uh, that's a potential walk-on for us. And we're trying to have our, our top six players in the 12 UTR and above range. So how do, how do the kids get on your radar or how do you get on their radar, yeah. let's say? Big thing now is, uh, again, um, email and social media. I mean, those are the biggest things. I get probably about 20 to 40 emails a day from around the world, um, students that are looking to come. So they're all looking to you know, say, hey coach, I, I need this, but I really wanna play for your team. This is where I come from, this is my background. And then I can look them up on the UTR or I can look them up on their country sites. Um, or I try to call coaches that I know in different parts of the world to, to find out about them and, and their references, talk to their families, things like that. Yeah. So you want kids that want to come to you. I think the, the, the main thing that, that I do is I try to get the, the top kids that want to come to me first and then going out to more local tournaments, um, some international tournaments, let's say uh, in Florida or junior US Open qualifying. Um, but I, I do most of the recruiting domestically by just going to different tournaments and then internationally because our budget isn't at the level that um, it, it could be for travel uh, we need to be smarter and we and we take more of the international guys that want to come to us or that I know a coach and I say I reach out to different academies different coaches and I say hey we're looking for this this is what we have available and then they come to us and say oh I have this guy I have this guy I have this guy and that's how that starts all right, so guys, if you want to go to University of San Francisco and become a Don, we got to be a little more proactive there, okay? Pablo ain't going to come searching for you, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so, so in recent years, I've seen a lot of teams kind of go internationally, right? They yes. bring in the kids from overseas. Uh, what's going on with that trend? Big thing is the, the international players, they're very aggressive, and they're willing to come on less scholarship. So for instance, um, you know, you have a lot of players that, you know, would, would the Americans that are like, hey, you know what, I deserve this, right? Because I put this much time in, my rankings here, my UTR is here. And you have international guys that might have a better UTR and they're willing to come on less scholarship because they just want that opportunity to be in the country, to get that degree, to have that chance. Um, I think the other thing too is uh, you know, the demand for tennis. Tennis is such an international sport and other countries have done a really good job in kind of waking up to Division One or Division Two or NAIA or Division Three tennis now. Um, and it's really factored in a lot of businesses where there's, the, there's been a lot of companies that have sprung up to help kids go and play in the U.S. for college. Um, that's just been going up and up and up every year. I mean, I get contacted by 20 at least a day companies that say hey what do you have available for the next three years i have a crop of students i'm working with um, but they're working with that for all sports volleyball swimming track and field i mean it's really happening on all sports it's incredible wow that's great now are those international kids more game ready did they have better matches over there not all the time not all the time. It's really interesting. I think that when you look at what's great about a UTR is it shows you all the results, adults and juniors mixed into one location. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the European players, some of the South American players, they have to travel more to see more tournaments and opportunities for competition. Whereas the American players can stay more local and they can get good competition more locally. Um, so you usually have European players that usually come in more traveled and maybe a little bit more mature mm -hmm. in that sense. That's what I was gonna ask, yeah. Um, where they have a little more, little more maturity in competition uh, than a US player. But you have a lot of US players that actually are better than the European players um, and they've just been playing local and their UTRs might be lower, but they actually are playing at a higher level than their UTR states because you know the European players are traveling to play all these pro tournaments and they can select, oh, I want to only play this tournament, this tournament, this tournament, whereas the local American might only play in their area because they can only play in their area. Right. So it's a little bit of a give and go like that. Interesting. So turning over to scholarships, um, how do you determine 
scholarships, who gets what and how much. Yes. So it's a little bit like a money ball situation. And I use that analogy all the time. Our school has three and a half scholarships now for our entire team. Most schools, the limit is four and a half and most schools have four and a half. Some schools, state schools might have four and a half, but they can only allow three scholarships to go to California students and then the rest go to the nation or uh, only 50% can go to international. Our school works as we have three and a half scholarships and we can give those to international or domestic players, it doesn't matter. But what we have to do with only three and a half is we have to be really smart. We have to get look at academic scholarship, we have to look at financial aid. Now, does a foreigner get that or an American get that or which one gets more? So it's kind of an equation that we use um, and for us, we share it. So everybody pretty much has scholarship um, unless you're a walk-on that's trying to earn it. Um, most of our walk-ons get academic scholarship. So they do get some scholarship, it's just not tennis. Uh, but for us, you know, we, we, we do it based off of, are you working really hard? Are you improving? And usually it's an arcing system for us that goes upwards. So you're either gonna stay on a high scholarship kind of the whole time, and if you keep doing well, you're gonna keep getting it, right? Now, we are not allowed to cut a scholarship based off of results. So it has to be, the player has to be working hard, player has to be a good student, the player has to be listening and trying their best to be a good teammate, right? And those are all the factors that we, we kind of, uh, we put in there for them to, to keep, continue getting their scholarship and to continue getting that more and more. And if they need more help, we always try to give them more help, but because we're locked in with three and a half, it's tough, it's tough. So how much is a year, uh, like a tuition and room and board for a year at USF now? All together now, it's about 67,000. So it's, it's the same as Stanford, it's the same as Harvard. Um, and, you know, San Francisco, you know, is an unbelievable city. And I think you're seeing that with a lot of West Coast and East Coast schools, where the tuition and the, and the cost of living is higher. Um, and so many people from around the world want to go to those institutions, right? Right, right? So they're able to, yeah, they're able to charge uh, a lot, a lot. Wow. So if it's $67,000 and you get half a scholarship, you're still on the hook for 30, yeah. 33, 50. Yeah. And that's where, that's where that money ball, you know, kind of comes in because, you know, it's, it's, they're all looking at, okay, you know, where's my best deal? And what kind of package can I get? And for me, it's a package, right? So do they get academic scholarship? Can that help their cost more? Can they get financial aid? Let's get tennis scholarship here. We might have a little more opening up the next year. So maybe they're on 25%, but then they go to 30, and then they go to 75, but then they gotta go back down to 45. You know, it's, an, it's kind of like an evolving uh, thing based on how many guys are leaving, how many guys are coming in, how many guys do we need at that moment? Um, think all these factors all the time. Wow, that's yeah. that sounds like a full-time job in <laughs> itself. <laughs> the recruiting is, is hard, it's hard, yeah, it is. All right, so calculate all that in. So money ball, okay, remember that, <laughs> all right? Wherever you wanna go, think of that. Think of your parents, that's all right? That's true. They're, they're who's gonna be paying for that's, where you're going. That's so uh, true. If not, you're gonna have, what, $200,000 in debt when you come out like everybody else. Wow. Um, all right, so switching to practice. I see your guys practicing, and you're always pumping them up. Like, this guy's the best cheerleader out there, the best cheerleader coach that I've seen out there. It's like the Energizer Bunny times a thousand. It's like he's court to court. Come on, man. Come on. Let's do this. Right? All right? So, so he's always pumping up his players, right? Uh, why do these players get down on themselves so yes. easily? Well, that's such a good question. That's my job. So my job, you know, I was thinking about this, um, you know, talking to you and, and, and being here with, with you and Joanne. And, and now my, my whole thing is, okay, what is my job day to day? Day to day, I am trying to get my guys to practice the right way for the time they're on the court and that's it. So leave it all out there. If you only have an hour and a half that day, you leave it all out there. If you have two hours, you leave it all out there. You know, and that's, if they can do that, they're going to improve. 
and the culture of your team, if guys can buy into that, the culture will be good. But they, they gotta understand that, that that's their job, is to get out there, have fun, pump, their self, pump themselves up, be, be, be like that on a day-to-day -day consistent basis, because that's gonna help out the whole culture of the team. And if they see that from me, and JT and Andrew and you know the coaches that we've had, Matt Barry and we've had you know Charlie Cutler, we've had some great coaches. If they see that from us, then it helps them do it. It helps them do it. Now, the the negativity piece, that's something that every player has to fight, right? It's that demon that's on their shoulder and that critical mind all the time. And tennis, you know, you have such perfectionists in there. That's our job is to try to tell them, all right, let's let it go. Let's let it go. Let's move on. And that energy that we bring helps them do that. And that's why you see us, you see us and you're like, wow, are they bringing it today? Wow, they're bringing it. They're bringing it. And look at the coaches. The coaches are showing them that. Our goal as coaches is to do that and then step off the gas and still hear it. And we know we're doing a good job. If we step away and we can hear them doing it, we're like, okay. All right, the team's gonna do well this year. We can hear them. This is good. This is good. If we don't hear them, then we're a little worried. Then we're a little worried because then we know it's a lot of individuals out there. So what he's trying to tell you, you people who are not even in college, is let it go. Let it go. Tennis is too fast of a game to hang on to any negativities. Because if you hang on to those negativities, you are done. You're, that set's going to be over like that. And then after that set, that match is going to be done. So we got to let that bad point go and move on. Stay positive, all right? No matter what level you are at, all right? Speaking from the man, all right? I love it. So some of the guys that I've seen that we've even talked about, they, in practice, play like freaking Fetter. Right? I mean, it's like you can't beat this guy in practice. Right? Once you get him on a match against even like the worst player against another college team, they they fall apart. Like, wh what's going on there? It's so tough. Yeah, and, and a difference between practice and competition. So one of the big things that we talk about in in our in our team and in, in our culture of our team is expect practice to be uncomfortable. Expect practice to be tough not only physically, but mentally. And so for us, we try to make practice very tough. Okay, you got three minutes to warm up and you're gonna have to play a set right now, starting from three all, 30 all every game. Coach, I'm not ready. Coach, I'm not warmed up. I didn't take enough serves. Don't worry about it. No do excuses. Do the best you can with what you have right now, right? Because in that moment, in that match, right? You're not gonna be feeling good. You're gonna be tight. You know, maybe this guy's playing unbelievable. Maybe there's wins. Who knows? There's going to be so many uncontrollables. So we just constantly are on the guys with only worry about what you can control. That's it. Can you control it? Do your best to do it. Can you not control it? Why are you thinking about it? Why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting your time on that? That's it. You got to stay really simple to that rule. If not, you're going to have tons of players that can practice so well and then compete so poor, it's amazing. And we've seen it in our team multiple times. You know, our team, we're, we're a grassroots team. I mean, three and a half scholarships going against the Stanfords, the Cals, right? Going against the, the, the UCLA's every year. And what do we expect? We gotta compete our, our, our butts off, but, right? We know our players, they're not at that talent level. So if they go in there thinking, okay, first of all, I'm worried about everything else and I'm worried about how I'm doing, they're, they have no chance. So we have to have everything, just worry about what you can control and you believe you have a chance because if you do those things really well, it's gonna be tough for that guy to beat you no matter how good he is. And then once guys start having those close matches, all of a sudden they're like, coach, I can do this. I can beat this guy, right? right. And then that belief goes way up and then you see that confidence. Like Paul is a great example on our team, Paul Girard. First two years, beat everybody in practice. Everybody, right? Had such a hard time losing records both years. Both years. Junior year, it finally clicked. It finally clicked. He stopped worrying about everything. 
and he just started focusing on what we were talking about. All of a sudden, that guy wanted the pressure. He wanted the, ra the ball on his racket at the end, and he started controlling his own destiny. That's it, right there. That's the, that's the beautiful thing that, that coaches see, you know, year in and year out with these guys. Wow, that's great. So all you people who want like the perfect weather condition, do I got my lucky <laughs> socks on? Is my racket strung right, right? Do I have my lucky hat? Okay, don't worry about it, okay? You can't control any of that in a lot of environments, right? Play with what you got. Do the best with what you got. As soon as you start making excuses, you kind of already lost, all right? Just take what you got and go play, all right? No excuses. Now, just on top of that though, right? You have to prepare for practice and for your matches to the highest level, right? So if you do have lucky socks, what? That's on you to prepare with your lucky socks. If you want a, the string tension to be in a certain way, that's up to you, right? That's not up to anybody else. And that's the number one thing too in coaching juniors and developing these guys and their character. Part of the character is preparation. That is so important because do I wanna hear any excuses? I'm not gonna allow any excuses. So if you're not gonna allow excuses, then you can't let an excuse happen, right? And if you prepare 100%, you're not gonna have a lot of excuses, you're not. John Wooden's Pyramid of Success. Everybody out there, go buy that book. Yes. Right, share that book with your kids, share that book with your parents. Yep. Everybody needs to read that book. It's all about preparation, Yep. okay? That, we all believe in that. That's the number one thing. So we do uh, Harper for Kids, right, with right. our team, with uh, Peanut and Tim Harper. And it's all about the pyramid of success. We go into classrooms, we talk to the, the kids, elementary school. That's all we talk about. Take these little blocks and use them every day. Preparation is one of the major blocks, right? It's these simple little things but that's what makes the difference in those tight moments. Yeah, it's about building, building for success, that's right? It. You have to start ground up. Do it right every step of the way, all right? But that starts with you, and it starts with preparation, that's all it. right? All right, so moving on. Um, match time now, match time now. So tell us how uh, the format works. Yes. Or matches. So the format changed a couple years ago. It's gone in an evolution since I was playing to now. Now, what you have is you have your doubles, okay? You're going to have three courts of doubles, all right? You're going to play one set, no add, okay? And that determines one point. So out of those three double sets, those matches, you're going to have one winner. It clinches when it gets two. So when your team wins two, that doubles points over, and we go five minute break, and we go right into singles, either up one zero or down zero one, right? You go out to six singles matches, and those six singles matches are gonna be played with no ad scoring, okay? And they're two out of three sets. And then that's your format. First team that gets to four points, right, wins it. So combination, right? You can win three singles matches and one doubles point, or you can lose the doubles point and win four singles matches and you can clinch the match. So in doubles, you play three matches. It's a one set to eight must win by two. No, it's one set to six. One set to six must win by two. Yeah, yeah. And you have to win two out of the three matches to get one point. One point. Okay, yep. therefore you go in the singles, either one up or one down. Exactly. Got it, okay. Now. How do you prepare your starting lineup? Is it pretty consistent or do you go by how practice goes during the week? Yep, good question. So once we once we get the guys in in the fall, it's kind of up for grabs. I mean, you know guys that have been working hard and then they've been putting in the matches. You know that they're gonna pre pretty much have a good fall if that's the case, right? Um, for us, you know, we don't guarantee any spot. We want a really competitive group of guys. I want my number eight guy going after my number one guy. You know, I want guys coming to me every week. We have a challenge day, and I want them to say, Coach, I want a piece of that guy. I want a piece of that guy, right? Um, and then we look at who's working out really consistently, 
okay? Every week. I mean, it's not just one week. It's every week, right? Uh, then we look at, okay, results. Fall tournaments, right? How are the guys doing? Who's having wins at the highest level? Who's having bad losses? Who's staying consistent, right? That All of that bases into our six, our top six, okay? And right away, you can see kind of on a week-to-week -week basis, once you establish your top, top six, you don't really see guys move a lot of spots. You'll see guys move maybe two or three spots, but it's very hard for a guy to move more than that. And once you establish your, your match play and you have about three to five matches in there, you're not allowed to move a guy more than one spot up or down. Oh. So they lock you in. So I can't take my number one guy and put him at three all of a sudden. I have to put him at two. And then let's say he wins and wins and wins. I can't put him down after that. Yeah, I got to put him back up, right? So they look at overall record and then they keep you uh, not able to have a guy go more than one spot up or down. Wow. Okay. Do yeah. you do you research your opponents before you play? Do you see who you might be up against and yes. what their lineup might be? So we do match logs. We do match logs for every match, whether it be a fall tournament or a spring tournament or a spring match. Guys write down the, the name, the school, the, the, the about five things on their opponent, and then their overall thoughts of the match. Then they keep that, we keep that, right? So anytime we're playing that player again, then we know, okay, or that team again, we know. I take notes on every team that we play for intangibles. Okay, this team was really good at jumping on us right away in the doubles with a lot of energy. Their guys were moving right away. In the singles, they transitioned really well, right? Their whole team. Or you know what, they were afraid to come in. They just grinded. They just wanted, they, did, they didn't want the net, right? So those notes, help us and then if there's no notes or anything like that a lot of all the coaches know each other and they'll all you know help each other out sometimes now in conference you're not allowed to talk to another coach and get a scouting report mm -hmm. but if you're outside of conference then yeah it's okay it's okay do you have tape on kids from other teams like you know what we we don't really have tape on on kids a lot of players post to youtube now right <laughs> so we do i have the guys do a youtube scan if we don't know a guy and it's pretty easy to find a guy on YouTube. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So talk about, you know, in, in like Grand Slam tournaments, as we know, you're not allowed to coach, right? Right? Like Serena Williams, you know, you're not allowed to coach. But in college, you can coach. Now let's talk about that a little bit here. That's the most fun. I mean, that's, that's really when you are in the battle with your player and it's, it's awesome because you really have a connection to being able to help them and they don't have to suffer as much as they normally do in tennis, right? Now, I mean, at the highest levels, you're still trying to coach during the match. I mean, one clap for this, two claps for that. I mean, it, it goes on all the time, right? And, you know, and honestly, it's like, you know, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tough out there. You know, you guys are, you're playing, uh, and, and it's just really hard. It's really hard. It's, su it's a sport about suffering, right? But uh, being on the court with players is, is amazing because you can say, okay, hey, you can pick up on things that they don't see, right? Or you can control the tempo. Go to your towel. Take your time right now. Or speed it up. You're winning. Speed it up. Speed it up. Come on. Don't let this guy slow you down. Speed it up. Stay on that baseline. Let's go. Get ready for that next point. Let's go. And that is just such a great addition to helping the player perform at a higher level. I mean, we've, I've had situations where guys have been down a set and 5-0, come back and win. I've had situations where a guy's been up serving for the match 5-2 in the third and loses. I mean, you go through it all with your players. So in that sense, it's tough, but it's so rewarding at the same time. So, so I, I have a scenario for you. Uh, I know the worst score to be up is 6-0. I'm up 6-0. Oh, I got this thing in the bag. I was going to go out and win 6-0, 6-0 today, <laughs> right? <laughs> I go out there, deer in the headlights now, thinking it's going to be easy breezy. The, and then here comes Frister, Mr. Bear here, right? Got nothing to lose. Yep. Going for every freaking thing. Suddenly, everything goes in, yep. right? Yes. No matter what you are going to tell me, I'm still going to be like, I'm winning this match 6-0, 6-0, right? 
what can you say at that point? Because the worst thing is to be up 6-0, especially in this atmosphere. Yep. So focus on the process. Number one, focus on the process. If you're focused on the process, you're not connected to the score, right? What are you doing? You're just working and you're focused on your process. What got you, what got you a 6-0 set? Focusing on the process, staying loose, and playing smart points and being solid. You, were, you definitely weren't making a lot of unforced errors if you won a 6-0 set, right? So that's number one. Number two is, okay, one of the things that, that, that happens to everybody is momentum shifts, right? All of a sudden that player has no tension and they're so loose and they're probably so upset and they're so motivated to do better than a 6-0 set. They're not gonna let you get the double bagel. Right. They can't let you get the double bagel, come on. Right. What do right. they tell them, right? right. Exactly. They're gonna fight for that, right? You gotta expect that. And you gotta want them to fight. You gotta want them to fight and you gotta tell yourself, I gotta push even harder for the next three games. There's always that tipping point, right? You win those three games in that next set, then that, pl it's, then that player usually, unless they're a complete champ, starts to go away. They fold. They start to fold, yes. right? But if not, and then you start to get worried, and then you start to get tight, and then unforced errors start to creep in on your end, then all of a sudden that score changes, and then they believe, and then you're in a battle, and then you're in a battle, right? Right. So, so I see this a lot, actually. I just win 6-0 in the first set. Now I just lost 6-0. Or 06 in the second set. Now what do you tell them? Yep. Suddenly I go up and suddenly I'm down here now. Yep. Well, what do I do to pull this out? So if that happened, and that happens all the time. We see that all the time, right? So we got to focus on getting gritty, focus on the process, and being physical. What do those three things have to do with tennis? So if you're focused on the process, you're, you're tactically thinking, right? You're not connected to the score you're gonna stay looser, okay? Right, you're thinking about what you can control in the point. If you're focused on being gritty, right, you're super competitive, right? And you have a little bit more of an edge, right, to your movement and to your process, okay? Now, if you're focused on being physical, what are you gonna do? You're gonna use your legs, you're gonna use your feet, you're gonna focus on feeling like, you know, you gotta move, you gotta move, you gotta move. All those things will help you stay loose, perform better, and take your opponent out of the equation and just focus on yourself. So, leads me to this. The word pressure. Pressure. I mean, everybody's cinching like that. Gripping it tight as you can, right? You're on your own island, right? And the only person that's gonna control your destiny is you, right? How do you let, how do you tell them, it's okay, it's okay, let it go, yeah. let it go. That's, that's so hard, right? It's so hard. So breathing is a huge thing. Turning away from the court, a routine. So we go over a routine. So what's your, what's your loss of point routine? And what's your win of point routine? So right away when that point finishes, the best players always have a routine. They always stick to what they can do to reset before the next point starts. So a lot of players that come in as freshmen, that's our number one goal with the freshmen, is let's build really good routine reset habits. That's it. And if you can build up your habits, then you're gonna do great. What do I tell them to do? I say, okay, who's your favorite player? All right, watch them and try to act like them when the point finishes. What do you see the best players do? Right away, rack it out of the hand, wipe off the sweat, turn away from the court, grab the towel, take some breaths, face the court again, get down and hunker down and get ready. But there's a routine. Nadal takes it to the most amazing degree, right? Federer is a little more casual, actually. He's a little more casual, right? Sometimes when he wins a point, he doesn't go to the towel. He wants to get that next point started because he wants to keep that momentum. But he takes the rack out of the hand, he wipes off with his sweatband, he just does a little shaky shaky, and then he's ready to go, right? So everybody's gonna be a little different, but the routine and the habit is crucial because that's when you're tight, that's what you gotta really take your time with. Is I'm gonna say, whoa, routine, habit, let's go habit, get on it. Where's your habit, where's your routine? Show me your reset. 
So think of your happy place when you're doing the reset, okay? <laughs> yes. Happy place, okay? <laughs> Vacation somewhere. That's it. All right? All right, so coach, what is the one thing you always say to your guys day after day, right? Like, just hit that play button. Coach is going to say it right now. So my, my biggest thing I'm telling, like, I always say I love it, and they make fun of me with that all the time. And, you know, but, but for me and, and for my team, you know, they know I'm going to hit them with tons of positivity, right? And, and every day, actually, I, I wouldn't say I have one thing that I tell them. It changes. It, 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 it depends, right? But that positivity is going to hit them every single day. And I'm just thankful. They know that I say that all the time. I'm just so thankful to be with them, to be on the court, and to be, be able to play a sport. I mean, we, we just gotta be thankful, and I tell them that every day. So the mindfulness is something that at the end of every practice, I'm like, all right, what are you thankful for? What are we thankful for, right? And that's just something that I hit them with every single day, every single day. Wow, yeah. that's not yeah. the answer I was expecting, but yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Now, what do you, what do you want your kids to basically know without you saying it. Like, you know, I was gonna say, would have said this. Like, what do you want them to take away? Yeah. Like, without you actually being there? Yeah, I think that's, that's, and that's a sign of a, of a good coach is when players that you work with are all around trying to do a better job every time they're out there. So for me, it's did you improve? Did you improve today? Did you get better, right? And if you got better, if you feel like you improved, that day, then you usually did a pretty good job. You usually did a pretty good job. So for me, I'm always on the guys, what did you improve? What did you get better today? And make them think about it right away. And if I'm not there, they know that's what I would ask them. Wow. Right? So like, awesome. right in quarantine, they're all practicing on their own, whatever, and I'm like, hey, what did you get better at? What did you improve? Right? You could only hit for 10 minutes, or you could only hit on this kind of court with maybe no net. What did you work on? What did you get better at? That's it. So after the four years, when, they're, when they graduate from the hilltop, after being a Don, what do you want to see from your boys? My whole thing is, okay, I'm not only creating a better tennis player, but creating a better person. Um, and with everything going on in the world right now, right, um, that is to the one millionth degree. Uh, we got to be better people. And tennis is only gonna last so long, but it's a sport that's gonna last for the rest of your life. So competitively, I want them to maximize their time and be the best competitors they can be, but also understand that they gotta use tennis to help them for the rest of their life. So it's all about being a better person after four years so that you can get out there and be a leader. You can get out there and do the best for yourself and help your community. And that's what being a Don is all about. That's why I love our school's mission. Our school's mission is to change the world from here. So we take that to heart and we talk about that all the time. So when they say tennis is life, right? We mean it. We mean it. Okay? Because tennis it. is your foundation to the rest of your life. That's right. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank Coach Pablo Perez de Almeida for joining us today. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Air Dons. You, go Dons. If you want to contact him i'm going to leave his information on the bottom here um and guys thank you for watching tennis spin where we put our spin on your tennis